This is the Mojo, the Meaning of Life and Business podcast, where life and business intersect. Hosted by Jennifer Glass, CEO of Business Growth Strategies International and BGSI Coaching. We are dedicated to your success. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Mojo, the Meaning of Life and Business. On today's show, we're going to be talking about adversity and struggle and how sometimes that leads to success. There's a famous quote that says man's metal is tested both in adversity and in success. Twice is this true of the soul of a nation. However, sometimes it's even more important when it comes to us as people. What is it that really drives us? What is it that really makes us stand out? And sometimes, It's all of those struggles that we face that helps us lead us to greatness. And that's why I have a really incredible guest on the show today who's really going to help us see how adversity and struggle can lead to greatness. Before I bring my guest on, though, let me tell you a little bit about her. Martha Hoy is a nurse, an author, and speaker. In her book, Becoming Mother Martha, she tells the story of how she went from being a nurse in West Virginia to being known as Mother Martha in Uganda and what that means for so many people around the world. Martha, thank you so much for being my guest today. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And I have to say, when we spoke the first time when we were just getting to know each other, Some of what you were sharing with me was so unbelievably mind-blowing and just you really felt that your sense of you and your desire to give back was reaching through the computer screen all the way to me. While we may be on opposite sides of the country and your foundation is many thousands of miles away, The work that you're doing is not only in Uganda, it's really all over the place. But let me ask you, your book, Becoming Mother Martha, I just want to touch on that for a second. And by the way, it is available wherever you uh, get your books online. Uh, So definitely look up Martha and Becoming Mother Martha, where you want to definitely take a look at that and see how you too can learn at least one thing from Martha's struggles. But before we get into your struggles, Let me just ask you, the idea of becoming Mother Martha, how did the title, let's start there, how did the title come around that you became known as Mother Martha? Well, I started doing work with orphans in Uganda in 2014, and one of my sponsored children was calling me Mother Cherise. (laughs) And I told him, please don't call me that. I am no saint. So the Mother Martha name came from one of my sponsored children. Thank you. And I love how humble you are in terms of saying that you're no saint. Because what you have been doing in helping these children in Uganda is definitely saying a lot. And unfortunately, too many people that we know wouldn't even consider doing something similar or even a tenth of what it is. So um, I do wanna just throw that out, but let's go back for a second because you were talking about your sponsored children. You were talking about what it is that you're doing in Uganda. So let's kind of dial the storybook back a little bit and let's get to what happened that made you from West Virginia, a nurse in West Virginia, go from that to being a figure in Uganda of all places from West Virginia, it's not a normal trajectory. So what happened? Well, my story starts out with a car accident that changed my life. Um, I was rear-ended at a high speed on my way home from work. I went from being 
a healthy young woman to the only view I had of the world was the ceiling of my hospital room. I was told that I would never finish nursing school, that I would never do a lot of things. And uh, 15 surgeries and a long recovery, I did graduate nursing, nursing school two years later. And I ended up working in the same medical center where my life was safe. Talk about being full circle with <laughs> that situation. You went from being a patient and being cared for by the nurses and doctors to ultimately being one of those nurses caring for others in a similar situation. Yeah. And that was my dream. I wanted to finish nursing school. And when the doctors and nurses and everyone around me was saying, you're never going to do these things. And I used that as my motivation. And that's really strong when you have those naysayers, if you will, that are, oh, it's not going to happen. And again, the adversity that you're faced with, making that it's really showing your metal, right? It's showing what you're made of and all of that. And so you went back, you managed to finish nursing school and started working at the same location that you were a patient in, not that much before. Now, let's go back a or fast forward a little bit. So during that time, you had those 15 surgeries that really ran your life a little bit crazy, if you will, in terms of what was happening. How did you get to Uganda, though, from being a nurse in West Virginia? Well, during that time, the recovery time, it was a very lonely time. You know, I was home by myself, and I couldn't move, and I couldn't go anywhere. And I always loved working with children. And a friend of mine said, you know, I'm doing this work in Uganda. Maybe you should join me. So I met this young man on the internet. I know that sounds kind of sketchy at first, but my friend actually adopted his brother and brought him here to the United States to Minneapolis. And Jeffrey is his name and he became my first sponsor child. He and his brother grew up in a place called Balamu Children's Village in Kapali, Uganda. And from that connection and friendship, it just blossomed because I was in a time in my life where I was you know, afraid and alone and going through all these surgeries and he had lost his parents. So he was in the orphanage going through a lot of things. So it was like, I was a mother figure to him and he was a friend to me. And so you formed that relationship with Jeffrey and eventually you became a lot well you started sponsoring many more children after that right yes it just it just kind of grew from there yeah and eventually that's how you became known as mother martha yes so as we, there's kind of a twist yeah Um, a few years after that, um, my home life took a turn and Jeffrey ended up saving my life. And it was great that he was there at that time, uh, to be able to do that. And, um, 
you never know when things are going to go awry. You never know when things at home may become problematic for everyone to try and figure out exactly, well, is it safe to be here? Is it not safe to be here? Who do I trust? Who can I trust? Who can I turn to? And luckily, Jeffrey was there for him to be there to support you and to help you. And eventually, you needed to flee pretty quickly from where you were. Yeah, I was in my bedroom. I was in my bed. I was watching television. And I had packed a suitcase in a closet of my bedroom. And I had to grab it and run. So when that happened, I really didn't have any place to go. You know, everyone that I had reached out to, you know, even my own family had rejected me or didn't believe me. So... I drove a little ways up the interstate and I pulled my car over and I said, who is the one person in this world that I could trust? So I made a phone call to an orphan in Uganda, 7,000 miles away. And that's when he told me, go to my brother in Minneapolis. So we found a way to get me on a plane from Charleston, West Virginia to Minneapolis, Minnesota. So during this time when you called Jeffrey and you got on the plane out to Minnesota, there was a lot going on in your mind. I'm sure. What am I doing? You mentioned that your family turned against you for the most part, not believing you. You mentioned that there was so much going on that you really needed to get out. So the question that I have is, if you were looking at things, trying to figure really out, all right, I got to get to Minnesota and Jeffrey's brother managed to get you there. In your mind, at that time when you were going out to Minnesota, I would imagine that survival was the most important thing on your mind, right? Yes. You know, it it was, of course it was scary. I was going to some place that I had never been to stay with people that I didn't know. I knew Jeffrey, but I had never met his brother. But when you have no other choice, when turning back is not an option, you move forward. When I got on the plane that day, I describe it as a feeling of freedom. Even though what was before me was a little scary, I just knew that I had to go. When I got to Minneapolis airport, there's a big black grand piano. So I sat on the bench in front of it and I had a picture of Ivan, that's Jeffrey's brother, on my phone. And he kept texting me saying that he was coming to pick me up. So I was looking around the airport, looking at my phone and looking at the faces coming at me. When I saw him come around the corner and I saw his smile, I knew who he was and I was trusting my life and my well-being to the stranger. Yeah. And sometimes those guardian angels, and I think that that's sometimes the best way to describe these people that are sent into our lives at Sometimes we need to, and the, uh, that I'm a 9-11 survivor and about my situation with my Armenian uh, SUV driver 
that pulled up and said he had room for four to Jersey. And I said, get me out of here. And out the door went, don't get in cars with strangers. And mm -hmm. I went out there. And 21 years later, I'm still looking for that driver. And by the way, if you happen to be listening to this, please reach out to me. I really want to thank you in person once again for getting me out of Dodge, so to speak, um, on 9-11. But as we go back to the story, so Ivan managed to find you at the airport and you were safely out of West Virginia. You are now in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. And what happened from there? Well, you know, he loaded my suitcase in his car and I said, what's next? You know, I, I've never been there. I didn't know where we were going. And he said something a little deeper than I thought he would answer. He said, Martha, now we live. He said, now you can truly live. And that stuck with me. I, at that moment, I realized how I had been held down by circumstance. And I had never truly lived or forgotten how to truly live. So I spent four months in Minneapolis with Ivan and his roommate, Joe. Um, after that summer, um, my divorce went through and it was safe for me to leave. And I am so grateful to these young men. I, I really don't think I would be alive today without them. These two strangers that I had never seen, I didn't realize how important they would be in my life at that moment. So after four months, I still just had this suitcase. So a friend of mine had moved to Las Vegas and she said, Martha, come to Las Vegas. What a better place to restart your life as a single woman. So that's what I did. I packed up that suitcase and flew into Las Vegas to live with my friend. And, and Vegas is where I restarted my life. So I want to ask you, you said that Ivan said, now you live. Yes. And you decided to pick up and go out to Vegas and restart to live. Yes. The question I have for you is, what does that word live mean? Well, for me, I didn't know who I was. You know, I got to Vegas and I'm like, when you've been in a situation where you're under abuse, you know, people tell you who you are, you know, even where you could put your personal items. You know, I didn't know anything about myself. So I call it like a journey of self-discovery. I sort of hear and what happened next was like, was my becoming stage. You know, I was discovering who I am, what I like, how I like to dress, what I like to eat. You know, I pizza and Coca-Cola, everybody knows that's my thing. <laughs> so after I was here in Vegas, for a while, I decided that my passion was to definitely give back to these children. You know, I'd already started that in 2014, but my passion had grown. And then I decided that I was going to live. So I made a list. You could call it a bucket list, whatever you wanted. And you know, I always wanted to do and or see. And at the end of that list, I wrote, hug Jeffrey. Because he was in Uganda. And because of him, I'm still here. So, after a few months, I packed up that suitcase. 
that suitcase and I have been on quite a journey together. So I, I left from Las Vegas and I went from there and I had pizza in New York, best pizza on the planet. So I went to Paris, France. I went to Milan, Italy. I traveled the Middle East and my end destination was Uganda. And that is definitely quite the uh, road trip, if you will. <laughs> I mean, New York pizza, definitely, you know, I'm in the New York area. New York definitely has some great pizza. Um, Paris with the bread and the cheese and the wine. Italy with the wine, pizza too. Um, and eventually ending up in Uganda. And tell me more about the time that you spent in Uganda. Well, I went to Uganda, as I said, to hug Jeffrey for what he had done for me. But I had also went to see the students at his organization, because he started an organization there in Uganda called Amica Foundation Africa. And what this organization does is it helps the orphans when they come out of the orphanage to get job skills. So I wanted to see Jeffrey and I wanted to see these students at this organization. Because from my story, two charitable organizations were formed. So I got there and I, Jeffrey was waiting for me at the airport. It was a very emotional meeting, you know, lots of hugs and I didn't want to let go of him. Um, I saw the shores of Lake Victoria for the first time and it stole my heart at first sight. Uh, Winston Churchill called it the Pearl of Africa and I agree. <laughs> and I hired a driver named Sam who is now a part of my family. And he took me to the organization to meet the students. And he also took me to Balamo Children's Village, to the orphanage, so I could spend time with the children. It was emotional and, um, It definitely fueled my passion even more to help these children. And that's definitely incredible. And you mentioned that two charitable organizations or foundations were formed during that trip. Can you tell us more about those organizations? Uh, Mother Martha Family Foundation in Las Vegas. And then Jeffrey formed something called Amica Foundation Africa in Kampala, Uganda. Now he, he started that organization in 2017, but two charitable orders, organizations came from that connection. Sorry. So let's focus on your organization in Las Vegas. So, your foundation is working with these children, is working to better their lives. But tell us more in terms of exactly how you're involved and how people that are listening can get more involved and help out in the cause. You can sponsor children, you can take trips with us. But the pandemic came and has kind of um, put a pause on that. Uh, I was just talking to someone this morning about going into Uganda in March to do a medical trip. And COVID definitely ran amok so many different programs and organizations, but Eventually, though, you know that you're going to be going back. You just said in March you were saying that you intend on going back for a medical mission. 
which is incredible because there's a lot that needs to be done and many people, um, you know, especially in the smaller villages, you have to wait for the doctor to come because there's no way for them to get to the doctor. Mm -hmm. And it's great that at least you're going and getting that done. And if you are listening and you are interested in sponsoring a child, you definitely want to be reaching out to Martha so that you can get more information on doing that. So Martha, before we jump on, would you mind just letting people know how they can get more information? Uh, you can go on my social media pages or you can go on my website at mothermarthafamilyfoundation.org. Thank you. And again, that's Mar mothermarthafamilyfoundation.org. And we'll yes. include that in the notes um, of the show. And again, Becoming Mother Martha is, again, the name of the book uh, that Martha wrote. So Martha, let me ask you another question. And when you and I were talking uh, last time, you mentioned a really interesting gentleman that um, you had an interesting time with. Mm. <laughs> well, that could be a couple. <laughs> um, if we look at the princes out there, um, are you able to share anything about that? In my book, I go into detail with that. But I actually meet two one uh, gentleman's name is Prince Walagambi, and I, I toured the palace that his grandfather built. His name was Edward Mutiza, and he was the first president of Uganda and the king of the Buganda. I actually dedicated becoming Mother Martha to him, King Edward Mutiza because his story was very similar to mine. He was exiled from his home and had to run for his life. Um, and also, uh, when I came back to the United States, I met another prince named Prince Mwanga. You gotta love how you got to meet two princes. <laughs> and for any of the women out there, when you're growing up and imagining that you're one day going to grow up and be a princess and be with that prince, and here Martha's out there with two princes. <laughs> so, you know, take that. Um, all of us having our fairy tale ideas just totally go up. Poof. Um, but it's really interesting, though, that you did that. And I love the dedication that you dedicated the book because his life mirrored that of yours, having to flee pretty quickly and start over all new. And so let me ask you this now. You've got many years ahead of you, many incredible adventures that are still yet to come. Some are based on the steps that you've already taken. You mentioned the medical mission that you intend on taking in a few months. What else are you hoping to do if there's that bucket list item still remaining? There's a few. I, I want to build a medical center, center uh, in a school for the children at the orphanage. And um, I want to meet the Pope. <laughs> I want to go to the Vatican and meet the Pope. And I want to meet Jim Carrey. So it kind of sounds like a joke, right? <laughs> the Pope and Jim Carrey walk into a bar. I don't know. Uh, yeah. So that's, that's what's in the future. We want to build a medical center and um, a school. And so if there's anyone from the Curia that is listening, definitely reach out to Martha. And if Jim Carrey's folks are listening, <laughs> same thing. Uh, but in all seriousness, though, as we look at the medical facility and the school, um, that is definitely going to be a very worthwhile endeavor. And 
something that people can get behind in terms of being there to help you as you figure out that uh, next step and going there. And one of the things that you might even be able to do is a lot of people and different organizations are looking to have major impacts in Africa. We know that um, the African continent was a favorite uh, charitable cause by the British royal family. And there's a lot of those causes that are so related, and especially because, and you know, I think this is completely out of left field to Princes William and Harry, but because they're orphans as well, something that they may get behind in that regard. We know that um, Diana loves the African continent. Mm -hmm. They have gone there multiple times themselves with their families and really trying to make a difference. And so that may be an interesting way uh, that we can look at in terms of trying to get to helping you recognize and realize the school and the medical facility um, that can be there. But as you look ahead, if you were to say, look out 10 years from now, a lot of the world has changed. A lot of the world probably hasn't. Where would you like things to be though, if you had your magic wand that can make things right in 10 years? Well, at the core of it, I would like to see more compassion. You know, I, I have a writing that starts out that compassion is the catalyst to peace. It very much is. Um, if we all are a little bit more compassionate, if we're all a little bit more aware of those around us. And here I am, the New Yorker. Granted, I'm not a New Yorker, I'm New Jerseyan, but close enough to New York. New Yorkers, unfortunately, have a stereotype that you're just running down the street, willing to bulldoze anybody in your way because the tourists are going too slow. We all all need to sometimes take a step back and look at the people around us and recognize that these people are people too. Whether they're the housekeepers in the hotel that you stay at, they're the guy in the super, supermarket parking lot collecting the shopping cart, they're the garbage man driving around picking up your trash, or any other person that is around doing something that is traditionally seen as an invisible person. If you can stop for a second and simply say, hello, good morning, have a nice day. You never know the kind of difference that you might be making in that person's life. I've said this many times, it doesn't hurt you to be nice. There's absolutely nothing wrong with being nice and if the world had more people that take that moment just to recognize another human being i think we would have fewer suicide attempts as well too many people feel they're invisible that the world won't even recognize if they're gone or not when you can take that step and you can say good morning you can say have a nice day you're not just saying have a nice day you're saying i see you you are appreciated, you are valued, and you're not invisible. And that's what's really important. I think, Martha, what you're doing and what you're trying to do is really bringing that a step further. I think what you're trying to do is help us see more of what's out there, help us see more of what can we do to be making that difference? What can we do to help those who are maybe less fortunate than us, right? Here in the United States, we're the land of plenty 
for many people. Uganda is not known for the same thing. There are many people at home here too that are suffering. And that's not to say that they're not worthy of our support as well. There are so many organizations out there that you can possibly be supporting. But Martha, if you were looking out, compassion is huge. And I completely agree with you. If you can change one thing and you can start showing people how to be more compassionate, is there anything that you would say just to start with? Well, I don't think that you don't have to start with anything big. You don't have to build a medical center or help children in, in Uganda. You know, like you said, just be nice to the person in the grocery store. How are you today? Oh, you look nice today. You know, a kind word goes a long way because you don't know what that person has went through that day or what they're going through. Yeah. Absolutely. And just a smile. Right. I mean, women, we have a tendency to smile when we see another woman. It's just innate as part of our, um, I don't know, it's, I guess in our genes, for lack of a better way of saying it, it's like, oh, you see another woman. OK, fine, whatever. Um, but if you're thinking about it, just that simple act is an incredible act. And again, something that you definitely want to be checking out and again, uh, Mother Martha Family Foundation.org is where you can go to get more involved, see more in terms of how you can be doing more and going from there. So, Martha, again, social media, what platforms are you on that people can find you? I'm on uh, Facebook, uh, Instagram, and Twitter. Thank you. And you're definitely going to want to look it up, Martha Hoy, H-O-Y. And again, that's going to be in the uh, show notes uh, for this uh, episode and how you can reach out to Martha. So Martha, I want to thank you so much for being my guest today. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. I think that people are going to really have a really interesting reaction and response. And I know that if you're listening, you're going to at least to want to check out uh, Mother Martha Family Foundation.org, where you can get a lot more information. Reach out to Martha on social so that you can uh, be kept abreast of all of Martha's travel and um, any future prints. That may be in the mix as well. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, yeah. It, you already have two more than most of us. So <laughs> <laughs> there's got to be one more. But on that note, this has been another episode of Mojo, the meaning of life and business. And until next time, here's to your success. This has been another episode of Mojo, the Meaning of Life and Business podcast. If you like what you heard, please consider leaving us a review, liking us, or reaching out to us. You can contact us at bgsicoaching.com and let us know what you think. Thanks so much again for listening.